time when we left, last left the, this project, we were doing some carving. We had one kind of roughed out, one of the tail cones, one ready to be roughed out. But there's just a zillion projects here in the shop that we're going to be working on in the next week, so please join us and hope you enjoy all the things we're going to be working on. It's just getting to be a very, very hectic, well, it's probably the most hectic winter we've ever had, and we have more projects underway and even more coming. Now, during this little session, we've got this whole piece carved up, and it's certainly oversized by a minimum of an eighth of an inch. Now, what we have to do is calculate and figure out where we want to have the glue seams. That's going to be a significant thing. So what I thought I'd do is I'd make a little template for this piece, transpose it down onto this, then I know that's going to be the top of where this wing cutout is. Then I need to trace off of the plan where the wing cutout is going to be, the inner and the outer, and I have a little template for that. And then see if this piece is a decent match for the bottom piece. Now, once it's oversized, I need to put that cut on so I can shove this piece up into position, mm -hmm. and then I can get the final shaping on this. Now, a lot of things I had thought about possibly making a mold for this piece, but I'm not so sure that's going to be practical. Again, I, I'm, I'm leaving a lot of doors open as I work on this part. It's significantly bigger than the B25 part was because more of the more than they sell is behind the wing. And they sell actually are bigger relative to the fuselage than the B25. So the first thing is going to be as as we always do, make a template for this part and then start to calculate out that wing cut. Because without that wing cut, I need to be able to push this right up on in place and then trace out the shaping. Now what I got to remember to do is leave this oversized. Now again, just a piece of this artwork paper that we have floating all over the place. Now, of course, it's nice if you have a pen that writes too. That is roughly the shape. What I'm going to do is just add. I know I added to the part because I need to. I wanted to have plenty of material. I didn't want to have this piece smaller and then have to carve the skin down to nothing. So that'll be my that'll be my top lip part to transpose this. Now a lot of people, I've gotten a lot of feedback on this. A lot of people, one of the things they really pick up off the video that's excellent is how to make these patterns and how to calculate when two things come together, whether it's a cowl, a wheel pant, a rudder, a canopy, how to calculate all these cuts and angles. And I'm, I'm happy that a lot of people seem to think that's a positive thing. And the only reason I happen to have a little bit of a heads up on this, and I guess it's just by accident, it's from a lifetime of trying to do it the hard way and then ultimately figuring out there's easier ways to do things. In the case of making this back piece, I don't know how else you could make this and make it a lot easier. I mean, you probably could make it a, a teensy weensy bit easier, but I'm not sure. That's, that's certainly a food for thought. And I also thought of another thing. And maybe I haven't really abandoned this idea yet, to tell you the truth. I'm using this for a plug, getting it down to the final shape, and then trying to make skins. And I just keep thinking that's not going to really be easy. going to be too flimsy, and I'm going to need formers. And Although I guess one of the things you could do is laminate it up with some some real thin balls. So we're going to think about that. I'll get some feedback from Les. He's always got some good ideas, too. Poor Les, this morning he got up, and the furnace in his, his house busted a pipe, and I shouldn't be laughing about it. I know what water in a basement is like. Anyway, let's get started on laying this out. Okay, now that should establish our top edge. Now, from this piece on, now I need to get those two little templates off of the, the plans that are going to replicate the little, I guess, then we'll call them the notches for the wing. 
we need to make a pattern for that also. Now this was really relatively easy, the outer part. This can come right off the plans, in fact. And I made it way, you can see it's way oversized. Then I traced out the inner part. The, again, because of the sweep of the wing and because of the dihedral, these are both significantly different. So you can see where that is. And of course, then that'll be reversed on the other side. So with that in mind, now I'm going to cut these the notches, but I'm going to cut them very, very undersized. I'm going to undersize this by probably, oh God, a sixteenth of an inch. So that the final amount, I don't have to deal with this whole final amount being a problem. But what I'm going to do is probably with the ball and milk, get in here and take a lot of this material out so that I'm just dealing with cutting an edge. Otherwise, it's going to be a problem. It'll be very difficult to cut that edge. So now we have, well, in theory, this line would be, this center line would be the line, but we don't know yet until we actually lay this up. So I guess the next step on this would be, for me, is get in here with the ball end mill and get a lot of this material out. So then cutting these notches will just be a little easier. Again, this is, a, this is a, going to be a real time consuming part but it's interesting, and it may add some information that you could use on a, you know, a future cowling or a who knows what. I know what I want to do. I want to leave plenty of material here. And I want to be able to, I guess, come back to that point with the material removed. have one of these carbide ball end mills. Boy, these are just great tools. It breaks your heart to pay. I think they're like eight or ten dollars. I think I've said it a couple of times. I got these from Scott Smith as a uh, uh, like an award. And he must have thought I was going to just put them up on a shelf and uh, Load about the award. Well, check this out. These things are all worn to a nut, baby. Check. That is really funny. Every time I think about it. But they do excellent work when you want to just remove big amounts of material. Again, what we're going to try to do here, get down, look at this, I oiled the cable on this thing this morning, put this special grease on it, and it's oozing out everywhere. I guess it's better to just buy new cables. Anyway, that ball end mill, I'm going to cut the rest of this. Good, it's getting all over the part, in fact. Never grease the part. We'll see what that looks like after about another 10 minutes of grinding away. Uh, I left every single dimension oversized. I, I left even the length oversized. Took as much of this material out as possible. And now what I need to do is a sheetrock fit. Little by little, just go in here, find the hard spot where it's touching. In this case, it's right along here. That I can't pick this up a little more. And take maybe a 64th of an inch out at a time. until I can slide that right up on there and get a nice fit. And once I get to the last few little amounts that I have to remove, it's just more practical to do it with a piece of sandpaper or a Bud McKnight sanding stick. Now I'm always looking for the spot where it interferes, where it interferes. We're going to take a little more material out of there to get the horn wire out eventually. 
I can see each time I do this, I'm getting closer and closer and closer. I can see from the angle here that the hard spot is on this side, so I need to do the same thing over here. Let me get it over where it belongs. And once you remove a little by little, either with a knife or with a sanding stick, once that notch is in, we want that piece to fit up there nice and solid. And believe me, every time I do this, it's getting closer and closer, but because this is basically a cosmetic piece, it's not going to serve any, it's like a wingtip, it's just going to go along for a ride. I'd like to get the fit as nice as possible, and you can see I'm closing in on, we're up to about a sixteenth of an inch here. And I try to look for the hard, the high spot. In this case, we're hitting hard back here. Get out of here. And back here. Just going to take these two little pieces out, and we should be able to get relatively nice. Again, a relatively nice fit. If this were a piece like a motor was mounted in here, I'd want it to be structurally right and cosmetically right. When it's a cosmetic part, it's more important that it's cosmetically right and that we get a nice fit that we're not going to have to bury in Bondo or something. But this is the most practical way I know of to make this part. And it's time consuming. It's very time consuming. But when we're done, we should have a big giant conehead eggshell. Or we can make a nuclear missile out of this or something. Now we're down to about the last uh, tiny amount. In fact, we could almost force this now if we wanted to. Just a slight little shaving on this with the sandpaper, and I think we'll have a nice tight fit. Now what happens as I'm working on this, we don't have the glue, the whole part is not permanently joined. So as I'm carving and sanding through, I have to re-glue the seam temporarily, because eventually we want to split these all apart, of course. So we really only have a glue on the seam, not through the whole part, and once you sand through that, little amount, you've got to re-glue it. You're constantly re-gluing it, just in spots, hopefully. So, uh, well, I, I just I just want to spend a little extra time here, and you can get the idea of what I'm doing. I want to get this fit. This is going to be such a defining feature of the plane. The defining feature is how big the nacelles are on this plane relative to the fuselage, and I think that really adds a lot to the plane. When that proportion is right, and we have the flap horn running through there, and this is all hollowed out. This is going to be pretty neat, I hope. Now, with that fit done, I got this taped in position. Everything is oversized. The next step I'm going to try to do here is I'm going to make sure I have as accurate a fit here as I can. I'll run a piece of sandpaper through there, and then just with a couple of drops of CA, tack that in place. Then I can get the final fitting done. I want to get the final outside shaping done. But I don't want to hollow it out until I have what I think is going to be the final outside shaping. And it looks like we've got that pretty well. Well, we never really know until it's done. I can see when I put the tape on here that I have to really work this seam. i got to fit this a little bit better. And I got to adjust this. I have one side here I'm going to have to add a little piece. I'm just a little bit not in sync here. I may have to make a little, little piece to just glue on there eventually. But the seam worked out relatively well. Now I can just, this is ready to tack on. And then the final shaping, and that's going to really be one of the things I want to really spend my time doing and getting it as accurate as possible. folded up a piece of 220 sandpaper and I'm just trying to get any hard spots on here. I want that to float in there relatively 
easily right here. It feels like where the hard spot is. This side's good right up to the very end. And except for that one piece on the bottom, I guess we're as close as I could reasonably expect. Right here is the hard spot. Now what that should allow me to do, once I get the material removed is tighten this up. So when I tack it together, the gap here will be as thin as possible. This just keeps allowing me to grind away at the hard spot. In fact, I gotta go for a new piece here pretty soon. The corners wear out quickly when you do this. But this would even work on a cowling. Again, you can always use technology. You can transpose it into different areas. Once you, once you have some ideas of how to do things, you can improvise. Just there's a little glob of glue in here that's holding this from getting as tight as I'd like it. Again, the tighter I can make the seams, now I can still find the spot that, that we're catching on here. It's always like sheetrock work. Oops. Always trying to just find a spot that's interfering. And there's the hard spot now right up there. And as long as you keep grinding away at the hard spot, eventually you're going to get a really nice tight fit. And this, yeah, this is time consuming, but we don't want to have, if possible, a seam that's going to pop out when we put the model out in the sun or after uh, many years of flying. See, so each time I do that, I can make this a little bit tighter. Oh, we're getting right up there now. Trouble is that tape isn't sticky anymore. I think that's close enough and we're ready to put a couple of drops of thin CA on here. Now with that tacked in place, there's going to be very little carbon but a lot of sanding to get this to marry up. And then of course the hard part will be to split this apart and hollow it, which will be a whole other issue. But I'll probably spend the rest of this session just working this from all angles and, and basically getting the contour, getting it to match up to what these nacelles look like in the picture. Now I have to picture this, um, you know, of course with the flap in place, but to get that contour that it just looks like what we have in the documentation as close as possible. Those new cells relative to the fuselage, and these cells are gigantic. And I want to see see how much of it is actually behind the wing. Well, we're fudging it quite a bit, but because of the wing, we've changed the aspect ratio of the wing. But hopefully, the overall view is that it's going to look pretty much like the real plane when we're done sanding these in. like to stand back at the end of a day of working on the model just to see how I like the results of the day. And this was a whole day of blending and sanding and little detail work but next time we get a chance to have a session there will be time to pull that piece off, split it and hollow it but as of right now it looks very 
very much like what I had envisioned and what Les had sketched out in his the initial sketches that we made from the B-25. Well, believe me, this was a tremendous long day getting this to this point, pulling the block off. But tomorrow or the next day, next time I get to work on this, I'll have a nice a nice session trying to hollow that out, getting it nice and even hollowed out. But then, of course, <laughs> just thinking about this other one, what it takes to get it from that point to this point, ugh. Oh. But anyway, glad we got that done in one day. That's enough for one day, believe me. Now this morning we try to set up a little schedule. Les is going to be here later today to work on his geo wing. He wants to get that out of the way. But in the meantime, I have some of the little, I have an hour or so to kill before he gets here. I can take the little, I got to go find that tool, that little Dremel, uh, not Dremel, what, what is he talking about, Dremel tool? My little gouge. Start getting some of this wood out because as you can see, this is going to be, this is going to be a big job. It's like a Cadillac bumper, doesn't it? Karen calls it the cone heads. Anyway, it looks like from this piece of wood, it looks like, you, you know, anybody that would look at it without knowing, they'd take, take a little look at this and say, yeah, yeah, that's a couple of days of work. Maybe two or three days of work. It really is. Anyway, we're going to start, as soon as I have my coffee here, get a, get a gouge out, try to get a sharp gouge, of which there are fewer, and start trying to get some of this material out of there and hollow it out. And then we'll work on the geo wing this afternoon. Now what I did, <clears throat> because this glue seam doesn't go all the way through here, I just ran some CA, didn't even sand it up here. Some thin CA, because I don't want to have these shells come apart. I'd like to do this, hopefully in the top and bottom one. Now I just sketched out a line where I thought and it's certainly an oversized line where I would start this hollowing from. And there's really just no substitute at all. I try to do most of it, if possible, with the gouge, or some of it, because it keeps the dust in the house down, and that's a significant benefit for Karen not to have to deal with the dust. So while I'm waiting for Les to get here, I'll see how much of this I can do. And just very conveniently just gouge out small little pieces the trouble is when you have a job that you know you're not going to be able to do in one session this for sure is not going to be a one session job it, sometimes it's hard to get started you look at it and go oh geez but what I find is once I get a little bite out of it once I get it started like this from this point on I can just come back to it whenever Les doesn't need my help or whenever we're not shooting video and just work on it a little bit more. I want to carefully, carefully work my way up to this line and leave the line on. I want to have plenty of material on it before I do the final sanding inside. Because what's going to happen with a part this big? When it's done, it's going to be flexible. It's going to be, you know, let's hope it's not going to be as flex flexible as I think it is. But I want to work my way up as much as I can. And I could also use the ball end mill. If I get bored using the gouge, I can use the ball end mill. There is a talent as I work my way through this that I seem to have developed over the years without even trying. And I don't know how to even define it, but I can usually just pinch my fingers here and feel a thickness. In other words, I can feel what that thickness is. I don't know how you develop that talent. I don't know, like I can tell right here, we're really thick. Back here, we're getting down to it. So I don't even know how to, you know, how to uh, go about defining that, but I know that's one of the things that over the years has helped me do a lot of carving where there's big blocks, and now this is certainly one of them. The advantage of the gouge, again, is that you don't wind up having, a, in my case, breathing all the sawdust. I really hate sawdust. I would love to be able to carve right down to the last little bit so there was very little sanding. And even with a gouge, you can take nice big chunks out as long as you know you're not getting close to going through. These just jump right out. And I can feel this is not the greatest piece of wood in the shop. 
there's hard spots and soft spots, so we're just going to make the most of what we have here. Now, even if this were a wingtip, a cowl, it wouldn't, it wouldn't mean anything. We need to always know if we're getting thicker or thinner, where, where we still have material that can be removed. And it's, of course, a real pain by the glue seam. It doesn't do much for the blade life either. And I don't know why, but if you buy these gouge blades, anytime I buy them, buy them by the dozen, because on a project like this, if the blade goes dull, you hit one glue seam or whatever, carbon, it can be miserable. And you put a new blade in and it really goes nicely. Now see, this piece of wood is, is not too bad in terms of the way the grain is, but there's a hard spot right here where it's just breaking off. So I may have to resort to doing some of this with the ball end on the, uh, the drill tool. Again, it's always a combination of all the techniques, especially on cows if you're making a real scoopy cow. I guess there's no substitute for just toughing it out. You know, it's a pleasure too when you have a nice piece of wood that just carves up like butter. And then you get somewhere it's hard, soft, hard, soft. I don't know what the grain structure is that makes a piece of wood like that, but it's very frustrating to carve it. Now I can see here, it's starting to get down already. Yeah, as we're working down into this, turning it into like a coconut shell. Again, I wish I knew what that was. Just, I guess you just practice it and you're you know when it, when your fingers are almost touching, I guess you're using your hands like a little caliper or whatever. Anyway, it's just, just going to be a couple hours here, and we'll, well, as long as it is, we'll work right till Les gets here on this. <coughs> now, at some point, after scooping this out, it's just easier to do the rest of it with the Dremel tool. And I want to get this down to just a little over an eighth inch wall thickness if I can. Carbide wall end mill always seems to be one of the better ways of getting that last little bit of material out. First thing I like to do is get all the high spots. And what I'm trying to do is put all the curved lines in in this dimension, then feel the high spots, and go back in this dimension. So I'm I'm basically cross hatching it. to see where the high spot is. Now just to make this clear, now I have all these little high spots. Now I can feel, where is this part a little too thick? Well right here it's thick. So we'll take an extra line out of there. The idea is to try to get it to be an equal thickness. A little thick right here. Now when we go back over this, I want to put the lines, and of course I'll do the whole thing. I just don't want to make this take too long. Now I'll just erase the lines. Now you can see I basically have the lines almost totally erased from that last part. Now 
I can feel again. Where is the high spot? Now I'll go back in this dimension. And it's just going to be a question of doing this maybe 8, 10, 15 times. It's a good technique to use because it, it's very forgiving. You feel right away. Now, see, I have all the lines going to this dimension. Now I can still feel. Ooh, I got a high spot right there. Where is that high spot? And I can then I can start taking equal equal amounts that it's a little high right there. Once I'm happy that I have, I taken a cut almost up to the edge. I can see I basically have about a little more than an eight, three sixteenths to go. So I continue putting those lines on. Then turning the part, feeling for high spots. And in the very end, when we get down to the bottom, just maybe we'll do it even with a sanding block or something just to get the last little bit. But always feeling by hand where the high spots are. That's the whole secret to being able to carve and hollow out a block real nice. Actually get to this point, now the fun begins because it's down to where we have to really watch that we're not going through. So at this point, one of the things I can do, aside from constantly finding high spots, which I can see there's one right here, one of the things I can do is just take out I have all the lines in this dimension right up to here. And put all the lines in this dimension. Now pretty much they're all in that dimension. I can see I've got a spot right about here that's hard. Your hands really don't lie. You can find those heights. There's one right here. Remember, we basically have to do this four separate times for this model. So we want to get our technique down, and we, we sure want to get the part as nice, as cosmetically correct, and as light as possible. But now I can start erasing the lines and put them in this dimension. And what I'm really doing now, this last 64th of an inch, just taking little by little off. Now I want to do half of this so you can see up close. Now you can see we have the lines off in this dimension. Now I just have to switch and do the other side. The carbide ball end is a great, a great tool for doing this. Without the carbide ball, this job would be a lot, a lot more hours. Now I do the same thing. Try to feel for high spot. Feel one right there. step on this, the last step that we're going to have to deal with is we're going to have to sand this at this point, look around, well, you can see we have a little extra material here. I want to be very careful. This last little bit, I don't want to get any weak spots, and it's getting light already, finally. 
KTRS is ready to put his trailing edge on. No, I'm not really. I'm gonna make not yet. No, this one sixteenth windy ain't going to get the job done because these blocks aren't tapered, so I can't, and they're a little bit thinner than the gap. Okay. So they're not going to adhere to the sheeting. So oh. what I want to do is use this, this hard three thirty seconds. Okay. Put a set of blocks on, and we'll go from there. So you're going to eliminate the. The 16 just to add a 30 second to it. Right. Okay. You got it. And what we're going to try to do is when we put this, you see how this wing's sitting in the cradle here? It's got a little bit of a, a whoops in it. What we're going to try to do is go put it in the whoops in the opposite direction so that we can take that. It's basically the same as Rich Jacker bones where it had a little bit of a bolt. But if we can shim it in the middle and weight the outside, we'll try to counteract that when we actually glue the trailing edge in place. And in the meantime, we got this puppy. Okay. Karen calls these the cone heads. Let's see how you look in a cone head outfit. <laughs> oh, cone heads. We still have a couple of off. We still have some time to work on that, that's for sure. All right, so. All right, so. Where's that piece of cord? Trailing edge now. 330 three seconds. It's a hard 330 seconds that I found. Okay. And, uh. I so think if you just, when we jig this and glue this trailing edge on, yeah, we could dry jig it on and then go to lunch and it'll be dry when you come back. Well, that's what we're after. So whenever you have a bow, what you try to do is put it in the opposite. In this case, it's going up. We'll put, jig it so it's down the same amount and hope okay, that the wheels the spring back. Done. Now, this is the inboard, other inboard. This is the other inboard. Okay, where is the outboard? Hello, hello. I'm oh yeah, these are asymmetrical. Yeah. Hey. That makes building so much more interesting when everything has a left and a right. Isn't that the truth? But didn't we learn that on the... Oh, on God. Didn't we learn that? To the last little bit, these little sanding flaps, I don't know what you call them, flapping sanding things. These seem to be real nice for putting that final little curve on. But the same thing, now you can only get the... Because it's not a ball end, you can only get the curves in one dimension. So then the last thing is I'll take them, take them out with a sanding block with some 80 grit sandpaper. This is nice, say, for working up into an edge like this. Takes the material out nice and smooth. You want to get the last little bit. If you were a cool guy, you'd go buy some of these. They have them at Home Depot now. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that's where I got oh, them. Oh, cool. Well, I'll get them and I'll take them home for Halloween. I like that. They're good, yeah. Yeah, they're good. Everybody is redeemable. Anyway, I would think that the majority from this point on, we're going to do the rest of it with a sanding block and do it by hand. The last thing I did before final sanding is lay some glue on the inside so that this seam doesn't pop. I'm not going to sand that until I actually get that in position. And you can see how we've got a relatively nice contour on that. And you want to get a relatively smooth finish inside. And Russ is busy fitting up his carbon fiber spar into that geo wing and we'll be ready to get this show on the road. Get this lunch on the road. So with all little carving tips and techniques, I hope some of that is usable information. So just to get a to get an idea of the stages that we've gone through here, from a giant block to whatever we want to call this, to 
unhollowed half block to hollowed block. You're looking at a you're looking at a lot of hours of work there just for that one part. And we got three more to make. You know, while Les is working on putting his trailing edge and that spar joiner in, we're gonna set up this is this is from Tom Morris. This is the titanium end. And we're gonna and it's the most important thing, it's why I'm putting it on the video over and over again. We have one, we had made one of these already and we tried to pull it apart and it really was looking like it was going to be strong enough. But the most important thing, two things, are to get things rough before you use JB Weld. And we just happen to have this nice little tool here. One thing I have some experience in is secondary bonding, bonding to carbon fiber parts. And this is a a 332nd, an eighth one is too big, but see the shape of the burr? And what I'll do, I'll get that in there later. You could actually do it by hand, but it's just as easy. I put it in a battery powered drill. I need to get that good and rough, and that is important to get it good and scuffed up. Rougher the better. And the same thing we want to do, even though this is, it's got little barbs, making it rough is definitely going to make for a better bond. We want teeth. What we want is not a smooth piece that can just pull out or fracture, but teeth. As many teeth as we can get in here. And we use the, the relatively large parting wheel. The idea is just to roughen it up. The same way you would roughen up a belt crank post. No shiny surface. And as much as this may seem like a lot of overkill, if this part pulls out, it's just like folding the wing. By the way, it's interesting to look. Whenever you do this, if you've never cut titanium, you'll see the sparks are white hot. You ever see a titanium spark, Wes? See the sparks? You don't huh? need to do that. Yeah, you don't think so, huh? That's what you think. No, I'm serious. That's what those notches are in there for. Baloney. Don't worry, don't listen to us. Do this. The JB Well that I like to use, I, I much prefer the slow drying as opposed to the uh, the five minute. Anything five minute, there's a compromise in strength. I would always think I'd want to have, especially a part like this. There are just some parts of a plane that if you don't have them right, Boy, are you in trouble. Okay. Now the first thing is I get in there and make sure that's got plenty of goop in there. I don't want to have any dry spots. And that's got the whole thing. And keep in mind, like the wings folding, it may be that some of this is a little bit over-engineered, but when you're over-engineered, Ten years later, you still have the plane. When you're under-engineered, you're probably not going to have the plane. When you look around at people that have planes 10 and 15 years and they're still flying them, still in nice shape, usually they've over-engineered them just a tad. Now what I do, even rather than just shoving this in, I try to kind of do this. see how much oozes out. So now I just basically take this off. And once this dries, we'll wrap this with some carbon fiber, of course. A couple of layers of carbon fiber. And then we'll be all set. All right, center rib removed. We even go to one step further, take a little bit of heat. What that does, it lowers the viscosity of the JV weld, and now when this is drying, I'm going to set it so whatever's in this tube is not going to come down onto the end. Hey, you know what, uh, while we're doing that, while that's drying, Les is getting the uh, two things, clearance for the bell crank, 
and at the same time we've got to get a good butt joint for the spar joiners, the new heavy duty spar joiners, which have a laminate of carbon fiber laminated right in. They are heavy duty, they're heavy and they're heavy duty. Ten years from now you'll be glad you put these in the plane. Okay, once you have the clearance for that, then you gotta you gotta set so you get a good joint along the spar. That's your next thing. Did you do that yet, or? Yeah, I, I have it loosely fitted. Okay. What I don't have is the right depth on the ribs yet because we. Okay. Don't you got to work to get that sinking down so that the right. top, the sheeting is going to be right even with the cap strips. Our shaft is going to dry there. Just. So that any of that extra JV weld where we heated it will just run down into the end. Nobody could ever accuse us of being animal unfriendly here. <laughs> All right, now he's, what, what's happened to make room for this spar, this spar is thicker than the one we're replacing. And because the wing has a taper and this doesn't, we're going to have to either taper it or just lower the whole center so that it sits across and then the sheeting will come up and match evenly. All right. My, uh, just a rough guess from looking is when you get, you're going to have to take a half of this, you're going to have to take a lot more of that material out. Which material? For the belt crank travel, you're only going to have like... Well, don't forget, you've got a belt crank pivoted here and your arc is here. But the problem is once you glue this, what you really should do is glue one in, drop the bell crank in, and then do the, the pivot. Look okay. at <laughs> Get off of that, you. <laughs> You're making them crazy. We're not supposed to be getting work done. Get out of here. You're not making me crazy. You know what I'm saying? If you put the bottom one in, put yeah. the bell crank in temporarily. Right. Now, see how much You've got to do right because once you put the top on, getting in there with a with a tool is going to be a, a nightmare. I, that that just in other words, it's it's going to be difficult. Right. Well, the, the fir our first order of business is to fit the bottom one. Fit the bottom one, and then from the top, we'll put the bell crank in and see how much of that material you're going to have to grind away. I'm guessing it's going to be a lot more than that. You mean the top of this thing? Well, this. The, where the bell crank's rotating, it's going to hit here, it's going to hit here. I hope I'm not right, but I have a feeling I am. You probably are, Wendy. Let me get the phone. Okay. Oh. Now, right, you, no, you're, you're assuming this is not going to have any bow in it, right? What do you mean, not, not going to have any bow in it? But here's what I think you could do if you want to. This is a 16th. Okay, you could taper this on the belt sander. If you wanted to. Yeah, but, you know, I'll tell you, I think... Because it, you, you're losing strength the further you get out from the middle. Yeah. I'm not especially pleased with how this is fitting against the spar here. What, do you got a gap? Yeah, so there's a gap and it narrows here. And what are you going to put that on with, five minute? Uh, no. Or uh, a uh, slow CA? Gap, no. gap filling CA? No, epoxy. Okay. Well, it's the kind of thing that, that's one of the things, the fits that's got to be right, you know? And it's just that a lot of the steps, and even when you want to make an upgrade like this, you you know, it's work. Let's face it, it's... Whatever amount of time it is, though, I sure think it's a good investment. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Right, now you get some. You know what? What uh, I think is also hurting us here is this little. You got glue. Yeah, th that's the problem. You got little globs of glue there. Yeah, yeah that's you what's what keeping it from being a nice tight here fit. Is. Here it is. Because once once the bottom's on, then we can do the bell crank clearance, and you need that. That's got to be right before you move on. Now, but here's the thing. If you line that up, are your two sheetings lined up from top to bottom? Yeah. Okay, then you can drill a belt. You can figure your belt crank right. out, right. And figured, have your... Uh, I figured a belt crank about 
about here as far as how far back. Is that the outboard wing? Which is the outboard you want? Uh, the no, this wing. is the inboard. This, yeah, so, so you, you want in the outboard wing. Right, so you, you and then about here. Right, and then what you want to do is drill both of them at once. Right. And that will ensure that we got good alignment straight up and down on the belt crank. Bottom of bottom, top of top, so they go this way. See the essence of a fun job. This is this is about uh, three times a year I have to knuckle down and spend do a couple of hundred of these at a time. These are one of the parts, these forked and belt cranks that we have just had the best of luck with and knock on wood, no failures yet. And this is what makes doing production runs of belt cranks just a load of laughs. It is just more fun than you can imagine to sit here hour after hour putting these things together. Even less, even less bows out when I start doing a run of these. So, do I hear bell cranks? Oh, I gotta go now. Gotta go now. Let's not forget which is the inboard wing, which is the outboard. All this asymmetrical stuff. This is what's good when you make a an asymmetrical plane. Everything has a right and a left and an up and a down and a. Oh, so, so much work. Okay. Uh, the only problem here is you're gonna have to poke a hole in that. In what? That foam. No, because I'll... Oh, you're going to put it on the bottom. I'll pick it up. Okay. All right. But the problem is... Let's see how much we got to thread the lead got to thread the lead outs. Oh. Through the wing. Okay, that's out. And that ain't going to be easy when you consider... i got to go fishing in the... Well, we're good to there. But somewhere... We're going fishing. Yeah. Get a piece of music wire. Yep. Yeah. Here's a good thing when you have a rib wing. Get a piece of music wire and tape the leader. Right. Otherwise, you are going to be nuts by the time There'll you get done with this. Wire. Happen every once in a while. Les comes up with a brilliant idea that you would want to share with everybody in the world of stud. Well, here, 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 here <laughs> we are. Even I was impressed we with this. We found holes, and instead of fishing wire and stuff like that, we thought we would take the carbon fiber tube, put it in there, and quick tape the, try and tape the lead out to the carbon yeah. fiber. Sly is right. <laughs> So Wendy held one end of the tube, <laughs> and I fished the end into the carbon fiber tube, and after that, oh, it was a matter of feeding it. Well, leave the camera on, because we... <laughs> yeah, because you probably won't get the other one in. No, we can duplicate this. Now, we know what... Well, you don't need it on the other side. You can see the white... Yes, well, you, know, you only need it. This will this will show... Oh, look at this. Look at this Chinese fire drill. What yeah. we did. <laughs> see, let's crack the wing. I mean, this is the kind of tip that Tom Morris should be putting in stunt news. How do you get your front lead out on? All right, so basically... Oh. Now you can see what went on in the other end. And I almost just screwed it up by running it a rib too far. But basically, once the carbon fiber tube is in there, you have somebody hold it or tape it to the other end of the... And here it comes out the other finish. end. Just finish. Now, I'll tell you, this makes us look... Pushing I'm through. telling you, NASA's missing out on piring us, huh? Pull up bowling. We're yeah, we're we look at this guy. See that? We're available for hire. Hard to believe. So, you know, so don't say you never learned anything out of windy video. Don't don't say you never learned anything on a windy video. You had to put your lead out. Oh man! Usually oh. we do something like that instead of oh. using, you know, a piece of thirty-second music wire which we can reuse. We use a five-dollar piece of <laughs> carbon fiber which gets ruined in the process. Wes is trying to figure out a way to take something that's so simple and turn it into where you have to be a. Uh, a rocket scientist to figure this out. Oh man, threading the readouts through. How easy okay. can it be? Well, okay, you have to admit that's better than what we were contemplating. All right, now you got to line it up and see how much okay. material you got to get um, away. We are correct. Simply push this. I could have added a bathroom into my there. house in the time that we're doing this piece. <laughs> okay. Well, that's. Well, why doesn't that fit? Look where it hits. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. Wow. Right off the bat, I can see you're going to take a lot of that material that whole, away. That whole rib's got to come out. Yep, for sure, for sure. Because we are short by... Uh, yeah. Now, don't forget, you got to cut material away for your ball link here. Uh, no, the ball link goes up and down. No, no, no. With this spot, that ball link's going to hit. 
Well, considering that's the bottom of the wing, it isn't even going to be there. It's going to be... But I'm saying, you boy, that's a tight fit. Wow, I didn't realize that was going to be a problem. That The ball link is... How much does it stick up on the other the other side? Oh, I don't know. We're, we're going to have to see. Wow. But there, there is the thing centered. Right there. Okay, you got to take that. Plenty of room for the ball link. It's just that the uh, we either have to take a little bit off of the bell crank. But the problem is, what's going to happen is, once you glue this in, you can't get in there. It's going to be a nightmare. You got to get this material. Oh, I know, I know. And before you glue it in. Now. Right now. Yeah. yeah. Right now. Now that you have this great way of getting the leadouts back in the wing, is I'm sure I'm sure we're going to get a patent refusal on that. Yeah, you gotta cut all that material away now, otherwise that's gonna be a oh boy. Okay. All right. So now you see one thing that you've got to deal with here in terms of clearance, and I think that it's a good thing we slid that about this. Easy, huh? I did we ever measure what that ball link adds to the height of the bell crank? Because you could figure where the center is, and then halfway. Oh up. yeah, no, no, it'll clear. There's it'll enough clear? clearance here. Even but can you imagine now? Now just imagine. Here's what a guy, a newbie, guy, a guy does. A guy that's been doing this, not not familiar with stresses. He's going to take and cut this whole piece out, right at the stress riser, and put that little piece of uh, spruce or whatever. No wonder the wings break. That's a problem, sure. Okay, so we know about that. But this is going to ensure, at least this will ensure. That you're not going to have a stress, but you can gouge that whole thing out now. Oh yeah, you can take the you can take that whole well, webbing out of there. After we, after I've seen, now that I see the clearance you need on that, see what happens as you make the airfoil thinner and thinner. Windy, it's were, more of a problem. Were we bash backwards? Yes. Yeah, but th this is the problem with asymmet right. asymmetrical wings. No, no, no. It, 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 whether it's asymmetrical or not, you got to make sure. Let me get that the phone. Maybe maybe we can revive ourselves. You got very little. You see what has to come away there, okay? But this way, look how much we got. We actually have almost enough right there. So we take we leave a little bit on the front, a little bit with on these, the back. With these spars, you could relieve a plenty. Yeah, you know, you don't have to be worried like when you had the original spars that you want to take. Oh my God, that's going to break right there. That'll be fine. And for pull testing the plane, this will be just unbelievable. A little bit in the front, a little bit in the back. However, when look at we this. Go He's the using two way. arrow shafts now. Look at this. Is this cute or what? I love this arrow shaft invention. That is just all right. Got that aligned. Got that aligned. That's nice. Okay. So we okay, you know how much material you got to take out of there now? Well, I'm going to take out quite a bit. I would. I would. So you don't have to do this over and over sixteen yeah, right. times before you do it. Right. Now wait a minute. Okay. On this side, we need both fore and aft. On this side, a little bit in the front and a little bit in the back. Are you sure your your ball link? See what's going to happen as your yeah. ball link goes forward. It's going to be higher than it is in neutral. So you've got to allow for that. Well, I'm going to take a little bit off the top of the inside ribbon. That's All right. It. All right, we got another phone call. Hang on. Chicky doesn't look impressed. Huh? Chicky doesn't look impressed. That's right. Wait till I drill them into this wing. This took a lot of work here, baby. A lot of work. See, right there, that's where a carbide cutter would be good. Yeah. Get one of these. These little carbide cutters we got going on over there. Closing it out of here. Yeah, oh, well, no, I'm, I'm real close now. Okay. Now the only, the only, uh, we want to relieve this. Yeah, just to touch I get the back. So you decided enough is enough is enough, yeah, huh? Besides which. 
I gotta hit, I really should hit the street. Yeah. Alright, well, this I have to take home with me. Okay, well, hey, we got something done today anyway. Well, we're finding out how much there is to, uh, to f I can't believe that we just did that anyway with the, but the most difficult way. What I'm finding out is this is not a two, this is not like joining a foam wing and putting a bell crank in and ten minutes later you're having no, lunch. No, There's no, a no. lot, a lot no, of little no. things have to happen here. Yep. Anyway, we're learning. We're getting smarter. And the phone's still. Can you believe this phone today? Unreal. So whatever time we have left here, we can take one more look at our little part, our little project of the day. We're going to try to do this one off camera. There's nothing different about this. Just turning these little guys into uh, fully, fully uh, functional nacelle ends. Can't wait to get one, or even one of these done and get it final sanded in. Because once these nacelles are done, then we're going to start working on the fuselage. And I am really looking forward to, this is going to be one of the more exciting parts of the project. But we still have to finish up the nacelles. That's just, just no way we can avoid that. And we also got the boring, tedious job of soldering up another 100 bell cranks before we go to bed tonight. So. We'll finish this up and we'll see you in the morning. Now last night after we got done shooting video, Les and I had a, a really, I think a significant discussion about what he was trying to accomplish. And along with Mike Estella, who's just happened to be here at the time, we, we sat down and had a little think tank. And I'm sorry I didn't put some of this on video. We, we each have something here that I think we can add to each other's program. Now, I just wanted to, to mention this. Mike Estello, who you've seen, Mike has basically about, let's just make a little, little uh, dissertation here. He has roughly 30 airplanes in his cellar that are finished and ready to fly. Call that his Air Force. And this is something you really have to think about. A lot of people have to think about this, even though they never think they have to think about it. But just give this a minute of thought, because we were, we were discussing this, and I said, geez, you know, I, I never gave that much thought. I didn't think about it that way, but it's true. Now, Mike Estelle happens to be building right now four different planes. The bomber is one. He's got a smoothie. He's got a hurricane. There's four planes that he's in the middle of finishing. These are unfinished. And what basically what he wanted to do also at the same time is he's he's been buying equipment and getting things ready. He wants to start getting his model railroad under construction. So now what I'm looking at here, and I, I was honest with Mike, because Mike's a good friend of mine and you know my son-in-law works for him. We have kind of a good relationship. Mike is getting very frustrated with the fact that these four planes are taking forever because he's building four planes at once. He only gets to work on a bomber one or two days a week. He works on a smoothie one day a week. He, he picks and chooses his things, and he's really getting frustrated that he doesn't have enough time to get the bench work started on his model railroad. He's got more railroad stuff than I do. In the meantime, he's got these planes ready to fly. Well, so here's the way this discussion laid out. Les, of course, yesterday was over here. Now, in Les's case, he was out of modeling for quite a few years, and he really has no planes, so his, his Air Force comprises two planes that really are not even his planes that he's got ready to fly. And what Les did, he's got four planes under construction. Actually, he's got five. I shouldn't even say. He's got the the primary plane, the Paladin, this Geo plane. He's got a USA-1 and parts that he started for a Sky Raider. Well, now what's happening to Les is, and he's got this, this wing program going where he's got seven wings, all in different states of sheeting and glassing. So we were all talking, and I said, you know, what's happening to all of us it's not happening to me because I don't fit into this mold. Uh, is we're working and working and working and nothing seems to be getting finished. He's doing, he spent a week on a geo plane, uh, a couple days on a geo plane this week, went home, 
try to make wingtips on something else. But what's happening? Nothing is going to be finished. We're going to get to the summer, and he's going to have four planes almost ready. So I suggested that what he do is pick one of these planes, and whichever one it is, focus on one plane and get it done. Now that doesn't work for everybody. A lot of people have the ability, and I don't know that I do, but I seem to be able to do multiple projects and bring them all in on schedule. Maybe, I don't know. That, that's a, still a matter of opinion if you ask Karen especially. But what happens is when you're multitasking, each one of these, each one of these projects gets longer and longer to work on. So what I'm saying is if you had, in Mike's case, when you have a whole cellar full of models, who cares if you don't get any done for three years? But in Les's case, he really doesn't have much to fly. We want to get this guy done. So what we decided to do is at the end of this geo wing, he wants to finish this geo wing up, <clears throat> put that aside, and then take one project and finish it so that we have a plane to fly this summer. He has a plane to fly. So focus, concentrate on one project. Now I'm sure I'm not alone in looking around the world and seeing how many people fall into the trap of starting seven, eight, ten projects and then get frustrated that none of them come into completion. And what really happens, I'm going to explain how I view it because this is what changed my mind in the past. This is how I view these things. So you try to follow along with the logic because one of the things I seem to have a good grip on is being able to do multiple things at once and manage my time so that in the end they all get done. The best person I've ever seen that's been able to build more than one or two or three planes at once was Jimmy Casale. He seemed able to do it. There were a lot of reasons. He was very focused and dedicated. And, and was willing and able to put <clears throat> the time, the money, and the energy into getting two or three planes done on at the same time. But most people, and this is what happens to most people, most people are not multitask oriented. So what happens if this plane takes a hundred hours to build, and th let's say we each want to spend a hundred hours on a plane. This plane takes a hundred hours to build, and this one takes a hundred hours to build. What happens to some people? One of two things can happen. If they start all three and start making three crutches and start making three wings, which is what Les originally started doing, and then making three tails. Well, a lot of times there can be a saving in the same way we're making bell cranks is we set up the solder and iron once, we set up the saw once, we set up the, the jig to do all the alignment once, we set up the the thing to squeeze the bushings once, but, and there's a time saving in doing multiples, but not for everybody. And for people like Mike and like Les that don't do production work on a regular basis, what happens is instead of this, the total project here taking 100, 100, 100, this winds up taking 500 hours total. And what happens? Because they're constantly putting this wing away, taking this wing out, put this crutch away, uh, test this wing, put this glass on this, put this hinge in this belt. You never really build up a rhythm. And what happens, it takes 500 hours. Now what happens is, if you start at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, you'd have one plane anyway. You'd be able, well, if you then finish that plane and then... So let's say it was February, March, April, and you start a second one, you'd get part of it done, and you'd have a head start on next year, which is what a lot of people do. Well, when you start two of them, neither one of them are done in July. See, that's what happens is that if you start three, four, and five, what happens? Springtime comes and nothing's done. And I'm afraid that if we had gone down that road any further, what's going to happen is none of these projects are going to be done come summertime when our flying season our flying season is really only about six seven months depending on how cold you want to be most of the time but what I'm suggesting is if you decide you can do multiples if you're production oriented and you can make I'm sure Jimmy Casale as an example was you can make multiple wings multiple tails finish things to silver there can be a potential saving in setting up things the same way I set up to run bell cranks or when I make a production run of tune pipes or something where I do multiples. There's a saving in doing multiples. 
But for the average person who's not multitask oriented, it's a giant negative thing because what happens is somewhere down the road, all three of these planes are taking much longer than you thought. Summer's coming and you get frustrated. And that's what's happening, part of what's happening. And so I wanted to mention that, that we, after about three hours of this discussion, we kind of decided that it would be best for Les to finish this geo wing and just put it away for, the, for now and concentrate and take all of his efforts, as much of his efforts as possible, in whichever project he wants to work on and finish one. And so maybe that's information, maybe that's a thought you can use in your own program. That's something you want to think about before you plan three, four, five projects at once. I don't know. But it's, it's something we've discussed in the shop and something that I think everybody should be aware of. Because I think we all fall into the trap of thinking we have more time than we do, thinking we have more energy. And it does get frustrating when projects fall behind what you perceive as their, the time they should be finished. And in our case, as cold and awful as this winter's been, summer is coming. Now, in my case, it doesn't matter. I have seven planes, and in this house, there are seven planes ready to fly with the engines, the needle valve set, handles on, handles adjusted. We, I don't really need another plane. The plane I have is, at best, another luxury item. When you have a giant air force of planes, there are three planes up in a Spitfire bedroom ready to fly. This gives me the luxury of doing experimental projects or doing things that I enjoy doing or just just multitasking and helping less. But it gives me choices. But if I didn't have a plane to fly this summer, then I'd have to knuckle down. I, I'd have to just put my nose to the grindstone a little harder. Now, and this was the year of 86, and I remember in 86 thinking, well, I'm going to build two of these. And and trying to get two planes done at the same time and get them both ready to fly in the spring and buffing both of them out. And you know what, for me it was just too much. It just wasn't fun at some point in time because I wasn't, I wasn't prepared really to, do, to take away from my family time or take away from my other activities and just become a one-dimensional person. But I learned a valuable lesson. And for me, I realized, for my case, I need to finish one project before I start another one. The year I made the little cardinal, I realized I could have built more that year, but I was helping other people with their projects. And so I kind of skipped the year, and that was fun skipping a year. But right now, I do things, and I, and I kind of encourage other people, do what you feel like doing, and not tie yourself up to somebody else's uh, vision of what should be. If you feel like building a profile, build a profile. If you feel like building a bomber, build a bomber. If you feel like becoming Mike Costello's twin evil brother and building ten planes at once, or if you just don't feel like building at all, just hanging around. You pick the things at this point in our lives, you pick the things that entertain you, and then try to do them to the best of your ability, and that's within, of course, within the time limits we all have. So I think to, <coughs> to end this, this little quick discussion, here are the things that I think are important, is to decide what's right for you. Because nobody can decide what's right for you. You have to decide. If you think you'd be better off starting one project, finishing it, flying it, and being done with it, well, there are certainly some advantages. If, if you kind of enjoy the fact, and I'm sure Mike does, that he's got all these things going on at the same time. Well, and if that works for him, that's great too. And the only thing to be aware of, that if, if you feel either uncomfortable either way, if you're not happy, start a second plane. But if you see it gets out of, or third plane, or whatever, you see it's not moving along to your satisfaction, well, then you got to stop and focus. And I think just thinking about this like we did last night and talking about it, gives us all a better chance to understand what's best for us. Because ultimately, it's what's best for us. You have to decide. I can clearly remember, because most of the stuff we have on the old, old, old videos, I can
can clearly remember trying to do two and three things at once, and along would come the spring, the first weekends of spring, and I'd be frustrated. Other people that were working on one plane would be buffed out and be telling me how they have their paint buffed out, and I'd be sitting there not even having a clear on a plane yet. So, But I kind of figured out what was best for me, and over the course of the years came up with uh, my own little way of dealing with things that seems to have worked for me. But it took a long time to think it through. It wasn't, it wasn't the kind of thing that uh, I came to that conclusion overnight. That's for sure. I got another copy of this from Al. I just love this. <laughs> I designed my own model airplane. I call it the Windy. Cool. What's a Windy? And how many Windies are there? Really, one Windy, or is he building two Windies? <laughs> anyway. Without any further ado, the king of building multiple planes, and I think he built 30 or 40 planes in the time he was in a hobby, Jimmy Cassell. My hat is still off to you, kid. But I just think that a lot of times you gotta really, it takes time, it takes energy, but you gotta decide what's right for you, and make sure you're not going down the wrong road. The sooner you make the turn off onto the road that's right for you, I think the happier you'll be. Anyway. Some good little thoughts. And we are back to the shop. We're back to multitasking today. We got things to do. We got eight, ten things to do in the shop today. Just what I was talking about. And without belaboring or repeating things too much, basically I'm going to go through all the same steps. This is the other half of the cow. I started carving it up and uh, I'm just fitting it in between solder and belt cranks up. I take an hour of carving, an hour of working, and, and an hour of answering the phone. So far, the original one that's over there I just think is going to be uh, as good as we can make it. Usually the second one will go just a little faster. We hope it does, but we're certainly not on any time window or time schedule. And when we get this hollowed out, we'll match them together and Hopefully have one they sell finished within the next couple of days. Pretty much the rest of this, this last final little bit, I'll have to get a piece of sandpaper. I want to get that cleaned up inside and pretty much ready to join them back together. Excited to see how this is going to look when it's all, well, I can't really attach it yet because I'd have to put the wire in for the horn, but I can get a, get the, uh, the overall look once it's all attached, hollowed out. Kind of neat, but, but the reality is I know there's another one to do. The, what's nice is a twin engine plane is twice as much aggravation, twice as much work, twice as much everything. It's also twice as much fun. Yeah, you can see the last little step, and I always do it, I always sand these parts nice and smooth inside. And then what I'll do is, once I get this sanded smooth, we're going to do the inside seam and then join these parts together. Now, before I go any further, One of the things I want to make sure is that I have this seam glued on the inside. I'll just make the joint a little stronger. Now I have to get the other part and then make sure these match up relatively nice and we'll glue them together. 
And believe it or not, old conehead here was quite a part to make. This was this was a lot more work than I think you can really see on video, but even though we didn't have really prime wood, I think we've got it down as light as we possibly can. I wanted to leave a little bit of material extra, maybe a 64th, so I can really final sand that in and true that surface up. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to run these on a surfacer. Where is my surfacer? Now what I'll do is tape them together. Leave the dust on. And at this point, we're at one watershed of knowing that we have a exactly half of the cone heads done. The cone heads, that's a cute name for them. Believe me, every time I look, that is a lot of work. That is a lot of work. I have this piece taped, and of course what I'll try to do is even up the outside skin, and in between the two tapes, just put a, a tack always something this big, I want to tack it first. We'll go to the other side, even up the outside skin as much as possible. And that little bit of dust that stays in there is what helps it kick off. You know, we're still delicate here in the back. I can tack this in the back, make sure this comes together the way I want. Give that tape. Now I can find another spot back here to tack this. Now I can't install this until I get the wires. All I'm going to do is just while I'm in the mood to do all this carving, next couple days I'll get the other one carved. And then I'll have to get in, make the horn, get all the wires for the control horns together. Now once it's tacked like that, then what, what I like to do is take one piece of tape at a time. <coughs> I want this hole, I want this seam to be glued on both sides because I don't want this seam to be coming through the paint years from now or, or even sooner. I'm just going to press up together. Try never to use kicker just to keep the glue joint neat. So if you restore in a 57 Caddy, I have a nice balsa bumper for you. In the 50s, all the cars had these big points, fins and points. Okay, now that that's done, get off all the tape. Now what I can do is just basically run the seam down the inside. I always want to have that seam glue inside. Just makes for a stronger joint and what what I don't want to happen is once this is all tissued and buffed and has ink lines on it is see a crack come through. Now other than a quick final sanding over by the sanding bench, that looks ready to go. We are exactly halfway done. It's hard to even say. And I'll tell you, 
when you look at a block like this and you look at the final part, that is, that is something special. But anyway, I hope those little tips that we've had from carving and sanding, I'm obviously going to do the other one off camera. Mr. Conehead, you're a good boy. Just thinking about early hours. But anyway, we'll do that one off camera, and then we'll be ready to start fitting these up, I hope. And once these are done, the actual fitting and the final fitting, we're a couple of days away from that now, but I always like to just think about any way I can of making the second job easier. The second one always goes a little quicker. But right now, haven't come up with any brainstorm, so we're just going to get out the knives and the sandpaper and the sanding mess and dig in and try to finish these in the cells. Well, here, here we are, day one ends, and we have two cone heads. The only problem, of course, with this, we'll be spending most of the day tomorrow hollowing it out and fitting it to the wing and whatever, but to go from that to this, tricky enough. Anyway, after all that carving, I need a rest.
today we decided, uh, John Flodak and I thought it would be a good thing. We're going to rescue the sweeper later this week. George Venturini, who's been taking a sweeper for all these years, and this goes back, that plane was built in 1979. Now just keep this in mind when we talk about longevity. Well, I have my own little private museum up here with the things that really uh, interest and that I have a passion for. But John Brodak is planning on building, as far as I know, a, a dedicated control line museum. And I wanted to be one of the first ones to contribute something that, that I thought was a piece of stunt history. The sweeper was on the cover of the August 81 flying models. It certainly was, a, I don't know, a trendsetter. As planes got bigger and bigger, they never got as big as the sweeper, but they were trying. They just never got there. But here's my point. When you build planes like I do, and my intention is that they last forever and ever, or well, hopefully as long as they can. Well, at some point in time, even you'll wind up with your own museum, hopefully. And it's just nice to know that the, the sweeper will hopefully go on and on and on and on. That'll be a nice little, uh, a nice resting place for it in John Brodak's personal control line museum. We're going to be doing that in the weekend coming up. One of these Spitfire Seafires has some special memories for me. I don't think, uh, well, I don't know what you would do with these planes when they were basically done flying them if you didn't have your own little private museum. The three Spitfires between them won four concourse awards. I don't know if that's the record. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But they sure have had some special memories for me. Back to carving. Oh boy, I'm telling you, tomorrow I just can't wait up. Wait to get up and start carving. Unbelievable. I believe it or not, Dale Berry is making a copy of this. As we speak, he's got the plans in the magazine. And here's the other one. This is the one that's going out to Brodax. We're going to go pick that up Saturday or Sunday, depending on when George is going to be around. I looked everywhere, and I don't have a, a copy of the magazine. It's August 81. And this was, I don't know, in the 60s. But just think about the 60s. Where were you in the 60s? How old, how old were my kids? They weren't even born yet. Unbelievable. Hard to believe. What it means is we're all getting old. Now, off to the sanding paper. This morning back to the job at hand here. I had thought, hey, I'm, I'm always trying to find some sneaky way to save time. Remember, these are these are now reversed, and I thought, without realizing they're asymmetrical, yeah, it's not gonna work. But if I were to just trace out, I can see I've got a pretty good fit. It's, it's very similar, except for these cutouts. So that'll be a big help because I have it template for where that first part is going to wind up. So by having this template, let's just see where that's going to wind up, about an eighth of an inch difference. So I can pretty much use, this is the part of course it fits right on here, it's real nice too in fact. And again because I want to do this off camera, I just wanted to see if there was any way I could cheat the system. Well, you know what? There really isn't. But because this is completely round and symmetrical, I can look for the nicest side that'll have, this side will have the fewest glue seams when I figure this out. Anyway, we will, the good news is we will be able to get some of that information off of there. Having all these little templates and things, and now we know exactly what that shape is. What I really have to do is just switch sides when I do that. Other than that, I think everything's going to be pretty much the same. So I may as well just uh, suck it up and get going on this big hollow job. Same as the other. Oh, I gotta, I gotta share this with you. 
can't do the kind of stuff you can't make up. I go down to the store on kind of a stealth mission to get a Valentine Day card. Of course, two days from now is Valentine Day. And I come back with this gigantic. Buzz Brodak would be so impressed that I bought this giant. You, you, could, you could put a half A engine on this and fly it. So I figured to myself that this is the kind of stuff that happens to me all the time. I got the card, I figured, oh, well, Karen's going to really love me. But that's not enough. I figured on the way back, I stop in a, get off of my back. I stop in a jewelry store and I buy her a nice watch. She wanted a watch. Not you. It's Valentine Day, not Bird Day. So now I have this big card. I have this beautiful gold watch. And I figured, well, what do I get for Valentine's Day? What do I get? Nothing. Well, this is true now. You can't make this up. Karen comes home. She went shopping to Costco and she says, Honey, honey, I got your Valentine's Day present. So, it'll say, I don't get a big card. I don't get a gold watch. My watch is 10 years old. But look what I did get. Now, I know you can't believe that this is true, but you know what's in here? This is what you get for Valentine's Day. There's 700 in a package, and she bought me 10 packages. Now, what wife, I, mean, I don't know in other parts of the world what people get for Valentine's Day, but it's not everybody that gets, I mean, John Brodak doesn't get 7,000. 7, there's, there's 10 packs of 700 each. For Valentine's Day. Now, how cool was that? And then I thought, oh, that's all I'm going to get. Well, honey, it's nice to have a lifetime supply of Q-tips, especially in my business. She got me something I really do need. As you know, our hair dryer died. We have a brand new one. But this is what I wanted to show everybody. How cool is Karen? She picks this up for me. Check this out. Let me tell you the story of this. So check this out. Karen knows I use Dremel tools by the by the thousand. Look at what you get here. Now, I was really impressed when she came home with this. Grinding, polishing, drills, collets, kind of little tools, all kind of sanding drums. Anyway, this was a great Valentine's Day present. And I was even more surprised by something else. Check this out. 205 piece. And by the way, the carrying case. Yeah. Made in China. Isn't everything. So what I want to do is I want to try these and see if, they, uh, if they're the standard we're used to or if they're cheesier in some way. These I know work good, the big cut-off wheels. They even give you some golems. Cut-off discs, 30 pieces. Anyway, the good news with all this stuff is, is the cat, the carrying case. Now I know Les, anybody that knows Les, what am I talking about, knows that he just absolutely loves having all these little gizmos in order. I don't even know how to open this yet. I guess you gotta pull this one up. Like I said, I'll wait till Les gets here and let him figure it out. I can't open it up. <laughs> Les, your problem. Anyway, anyway, the idea is you can put it back when you're done. And uh, the, here's the kicker. This this was nineteen dollars, nineteen and change. So we bought it. She bought it in Costco. But I think anybody that's got a uh, everybody's got a Costco in their neighborhood. I don't see how you can go wrong with that. I think that's like the buy of the century. And if you can't get one in your neighborhood, uh, hey, we go to Costco on a regular basis. Karen will pick one up for you. What a, what a great little thing. Let's assume this is going to work well. If nothing else, we got a place to store the stuff now. Here was my old thing. And, of course, the card white cutters that came. These are, these are expensive. These are like $10 a piece. But, but these, you can imagine how many thousand hours of use each one of these has. These are worn to the nub and half of them are dull, they're not even sharp. Some of them have all the edges worn off of them. These, these are worn right down to the nub. 
But anyway, I love tools that are all worn out. I mean, Les and I work so well together because he likes tools that are all polished and nobody ever used them. And I like tools that are really, really used. This is one of the, speaking of these little tools, John Pothier made me this. This used to have a quarter inch shank and it's got these snap off little grindstones. But every time, every time I see a bunch of fancy tools that look brand new, I love tools that are all worn out. They remind me of me. Anyway, great Valentine's Day present. And as if that wasn't enough, we finished up this guy today. And so now we have two Cadillac bumpers. Am I glad this is done? And they seem to fit. If I never see another sanding block, I'll be happy. Anyway, we're going to get back to the shop tomorrow. This was a great night. It actually was a very surprising night. Happy Valentine's Day. Now, speaking of wearing tools out, and, and we certainly do here in this shop, just, just look at this. This is Karen's hair dryer that I never should have borrowed. I got it all bouged up. There's nothing. It's, it's really probably 10 watts. Look at this guy. Turbo exhaust or whatever this is. What a difference. For doing fiberglass work, A nice hair dryer like that. These junky things, when you're going to do fiberglass work, I've never been happy with this one. Since we didn't, have, we had the little red one. That red one lasted 10 years. Well, let's hope this guy, since it's my Valentine present, it's a Conair 1875. Anyway, we are going to be doing some fiberglass work in the near future, and we'll have a decent hair dryer for a change. And I tried a couple of the bits. What I'm going to have. <laughs> when Les is here, I'm going to tell him. Yeah, you, know, you got to organize these a little better. I'm, I'm just a little bored the way you've organized things. Actually, I really do like worn out tools. You know, if you look at all the tools around here, this is, a, this. just give you an example. This is an Allen wrench. It's it's worn to the nub. Everything is worn to the nub. Everything. Every pair of pliers, everything is just, look at this, it's a pair of ice grips. It's got so much epoxy on it. It's got like a handle. You can, a soft handle. I love old tools. This screwdriver, look at, look at, I made a special tip for this screwdriver one time. It was for getting at some part of some plane or Z-tron or something. Great tools. Tools are meant to be worn out, beat up, like me. This is the, the top spar, working the top side now. Now what Les did in looking at this was realize that if you put the top, this is the bottom or the top now? It is the this top. Is the top of the wing. Okay, that it would words, be... The, the lead outs are going out the inboard side. Well, the, the thing that's different here though is we want to have, we want to glue both of these on at the same time. No, you don't. You can't. Are you going to be able to get the other one on? Oh, yeah. You sure? Positive. Okay. I, uh, I'm not sure about that, but let's see. So, all right, you're yeah, going to glue... Why wouldn't you get the other one on? Well, what I'm saying, though, if you glue that without the bell crank being in there... Well, the bell crank is in. Can you get the bell crank in and out now without a problem? You mean in and out of yeah. the way? No. Yeah. No, no, no. Once... Okay, once you glue this in, this right. will float up and down. Right. But then you can do your full rotation and see. Okay. Oh, yeah, no. The, we know we got full rotation. Okay. Because we did the test fit on that one. All right, glue the top, then. That's what I'm going to do. I'll get the phone. That's a good, good move. We're in the front all the way. We're on the ribs. Okay. Now that's dry. The first, that, that that's one, dry. that's ready to go. Now I'm going to put the bottom one in. And this will be, what you got to do is wiggle the bell crank till you get the bottom one away. Right. And get the fit you and want. Get the, well, the fit's done already. Okay, you did the fit. Yep. So now it's just a matter of some five minute epoxy. Okay. Magic. Okay. You ready to work? Uh, as I said, I think that this is one sixteenth and one sixteenth with carbon fiber in between. We might even be able to get away with using two pieces of one thirty second with the carbon fiber in between because this this is incredibly rigid when you figure what its job is. Well. If you're going to add a little bit of extra weight right on a CG, it's not the end of the world. It's when you put it on a tailwheel 
or you make a heavy rudder or something, that's when it really kills you. Agreed. Now, once you get that top piece in, or bottom, this is the bottom, Yeah. then we're going to double check, or did you already check that you got plenty of rotation? No, there's plenty of front. Uh, well, well, it's just, you'll still be able to get in there. It doesn't matter. Okay. The only relief that will have to be cut, Wendy, is uh, in the outer ribs here. And I have to put a little relief so we can get... Uh, You're going to have to surface. decide where your slider is going. I didn't see how you made the slider. Well, I didn't make a slider. Well, it's, it's a well you know, so you can yeah. get... The wi the wires don't start wearing into that. But that's no big deal. Yeah, but as you can see, even we have oolins of bell crank travel. Okay. Now, are you going to put your, your uh, ball link or whatever you're going to do on there first? or You know? I was just thinking, maybe you ought to put that on first. We're already too late. Why? How you put it on? What are you talking about, too late? Pull it up. Well, yeah, we'll get it on. Well, I mean, it'd be better to do it right now. Uh, uh, exactly. Well, you know, thanks, Wendy. Yeah, right. <laughs> thanks, Wendy. Otherwise you you can tell I screwed up a lot of stuff in my I life. I had to go ahead with a... Uh, with a yeah. bent push rod or something. No, 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 no. Get that. The resolve on this was that we had to cut the belt crank bolt enough. Show them how you can take that out now. Yeah. We had to take enough of it out that you can take the belt crank. We cut the belt crank bolt to exactly the size we needed. Now he can, well, actually it's he's going to have to do it at home. Okay, but, but now you can get it out now and you put got the, the ball link on. Yeah. Okay, now you can move it in and out. Wow. Yeah, that's okay. One bullet ducked on this project. Yeah. Okay. But that looks uh, looks like it's going to do the job. And I think next time we'll just try lighter, you know, spar. The, this whole section is going to be re-engineered on the next geo wing that I do. I, I'll tell you. you well, right you can you can redo this yourself. You don't that that I know this, you can. Well, do. no, the biggest problem is right in here is relieving the shear whip. Right. You know, if that's done ahead of time. When you do that ahead of time, you save yourself all this grief. Right. What you do is you, you go in and you cut the, the, the 1 16th uh, vertical piece and you're home free. The other mistake was this pin should be as close to the back edge of this bar as humanly possible. Okay. But that's how you learn. It's all these little things that you learn from. Yeah. And that's why we're so smart, because we've made so many mistakes. <laughs> At least I am. Well, anyway. you, we're <laughs> Well, am I glad you didn't glue that in and call me tonight? Oh, yeah. yeah. I could hear the phone at 11 o'clock at night. Wendy! Oh, my We're God! Glad. Oh, oh, oh. We're glad. Well, Chicky would have to, oh, he never let You're us live that down. You're glad. All right, so you're basically ready now to put the tips on. Yep. You got the trailing edge parts made up. Yep. Oh, that just has to be put on with white glue. And These are done. Okay. You got the ball link. I'm just trying to think of you. You don't leave anything else out of the picture here. Yeah, ball links. Uh, I better take the push rod with me, hadn't I? Okay, you're going to take now. You're going to bring the other wing Sunday, right? Um, uh, tomorrow. Okay. Uh, tomorrow. So you're gonna it depends on what we're going to get done tomorrow. Okay. And you're going to put this aside and start working on the foamer? Oh, yeah. Well, the foamer's almost done. Okay. So that's... Uh, Sounds like a plan. Oh, windy. Well, Les finally finished getting all the bell crank things put in. That wing is now on the back burner, and we're going back to working on what his, his number one project is, starting the next session with uh, getting the foam wing, getting the finish on it. He's got the tips done, the flaps, and the objective here is that I can start getting some finish on it for him. Well, our real objective is, and, and Les and I sat and talked about this tonight, we want to get one plane ready uh, by the spring, or maybe by the time we get to go to Texas. Uh, we don't know. That's about two months away. A little more than two months away. But what we want to do is start narrowing down the focus of what we're doing, and I think I talked about that already. One of the things is, for me, is I'll have some spare time now. Because, number one, we've been working on this, and I'm certainly in no rush. I'm not trying to put the push on on this project. But I've got a real good... Uh, little head start on it, I guess. 
But as soon as he has the wing ready for silver, I want to start putting the finish on it. And what I want to do, I want to set up a dedicated finishing table here. Midgley is supposed to come down next week, pick up the aluminum mold. We'll be done with that for a while. And what we're going to try to do is set up, and I hope it's going to be a uh, something that we can use over and over again. Because you see, I got to do the silver finishing on the nacelles in the near future. I got to glue on the back parts. I got to put the, the horn wires in. There's probably another week of work on that. But then what's going to happen, we're both going to be ready to start bringing a finish up the silver. And I thought that was just a good way to do it, is to try to get all the doping done, all the silver done, maybe on kind of a production line basis, I'm not sure. I'm not sure again, and, and certainly we never want to rush it to the point where it isn't any fun working on it. I think it's safe to say that by now, or hopefully by now, I'm about a month done with my recovery, a little more than a month, and uh, seems to be that I'll be, every day I'm getting a little bit stronger and a little bit more flexible, and uh, it's fun putting my own shoes on again, but, uh, you know, I've, I've weathered that storm very well, I think, and uh, one of the side benefits, i got to tell you, I've got to end this video on a real positive note, one of the things that, that has always plagued me is my eating habits, I really have terrible eating habits, to say the least. But because of this operation, and because of Karen's help too with this, I've gotten to the point where, I guess you don't see it on the video, but I've, uh, I've up till today, lost 14 pounds. So uh, I'm headed toward being a Greek god. Now, Buzz, I don't want you to get all aroused or anything, but I am, I am a little bit trimmer than that flabby guy you see in the videos last year. Let's hope I can keep it off. The truth is, hey, another side note, Warren Walker has the ring of this put back and hanging in his shop in some memorable way. I hope we're going to get some pictures of that soon from Warren. Warren Walker, what a guy. Now, and I'm looking forward to seeing this new Red Baron, now with all the, uh, the benefit of having this lettering all laid out for him in full scale. You know, I did this by hand, and I did this with masking tape. But this isn't one of those computer-generated things where you just... Uh, you know, you dial up, rent the computer, and the guy does it for you. It's real nice. And my friend John Poth here has been great about doing this stuff by computer, but in my eyes, this was really a labor of love, and I'm really proud of it. And it got me into the, uh, I don't know, did we get fourth? We didn't even get fifth. Ted was fifth. I got fourth. Anyway, it was fun. Good memories. And Jimmy won. And Jimmy, we've been thinking about you. And I mean, in the last... Last couple of weeks, a lot of Jimmy Casal stories have been being told. I don't know how many of them are true, but hey, we wish you'd come back to the field and hang out with us. I know your wing folded in this picture. I know Baron's wing folded. <laughs> but there's a bottom line here. Of the three of us who didn't fold a wing that year, I don't know. I don't know, I guess Paul is the best. But it's still better to have a plane at the end of the Walker flyoff. Three out of five here. That wasn't bad in 84. Not sure if you can see it here, but see this light up in the sky? Karen just got home and told me it's just before dark. The four helicopters are in town. A train. We just had a big train, uh, train hit an SUV. Wow. Right in the middle of our town. And I had taken a quick ride to town to see the train wreck or the SUV wreck, but it looks like there's plenty of action going on here. Wow, look at this. Holy man. It was a Hoboken train on the way to Suffern. Okay, so the train was coming down our way. Coming home during rush hour. Wow. And Here's the train, by the way. The train is right here that had the accident. And he, nobody was killed. The person got out of the SUV. What a way to end the video. Hey, instead of watching uh, some flight at a B-25 or something, look at this. There's helicopters up here. Helicopters up here. Hey, they're everywhere. There are two right here. There's two helicopters, one on top of the other here. What a way to end the video. Here is a happy moment from last night's program. Richard Hatch is a machine god. He bit a shark that bit him. I mean, it's just so, it's like man versus nature. It's so Hemingway-esque. I love it.
was the guy that got whacked by the train right there. Notice we're right by the front of the train here. Notice not a thing has happened to the train. These helicopters are going over all over the place. There's another one over there. Another one's coming here. Notice. I'm going to end this video with a very famous saying. In any time there's a train wreck, between a train and anything, the train always wins. True? Reporting live, Wendy Ertnowski from WINDY Radio. Hey, see you on the next video. This is the way it always is in Wendy's life. You just can't make this up. Hard to believe we got helicopters flying over the house, train wrecks. Wes putting belt cranks in upside down. Wendy getting five dollar Dremel tools. Unbelievable. It's been that kind of year. Just hard to believe. Hard to believe we survived this whole thing. Hey, but we will see you on the next tape. I guarantee you, the next tape, we got some cool stuff coming. We're going to get the sweeper ready for John Brodak's museum. The real sweeper. Lock up the women, the sweeper is coming. I have this picture hanging in my shop, and every time I look at it, I wonder if I could have looked in that year, 1967, if I could have looked forward into the future and see what was waiting for me. Wow. It's been a, been a pretty wild ride. It's been a lot of fun, and it's always great sharing it with my friends through the video. Remember when we had the original sweeper? And this sweeper? The video hadn't even been invented yet. It's hard to believe. Well, I guess all that really means is we are old. And we're not getting any younger. How ironic it was back in 1976 when I was on the cover and had an article in a magazine, Cycle Magazine, that they, without me even knowing it, put this title on. This is, of course, for my bike, 150 mile custom Suzuki Street Sweeper. Who would have thunk it? Yeah, you really can't make that up. You wish you could, but you can't. Time just has a way of just sneaking by and all of a sudden one day, you're not young anymore. King Kong of the stunt ships. Imagine that. And that was on the cover of the annual, the aircraft model and modeler annual. And of course when you think back, 20 or 30 or 40 years, you wonder what the next 20 years has in store if we live long enough. Again, hey, we'll see you on the next tape. Enjoy. Now, after returning back home, we found out the person that was involved in that terrible accident with the uh, SUV was our friend, the owner of the local pizza parlor, Frank. And uh, he was in the car when the train hit it. The car was pretty well demolished. And uh, he's okay, he's got some little injuries, but uh, we actually went to the pizza parlor and found that he was the one. He's the owner of the pizza parlor, right after we photographed that, uh, the footage of that accident. What a small world, unbelievable.